hey, if it ain't combusting internally, then neither am I. How big the banana? Banana? How big a banana? Is the banana this big? How do you, what is the margins of banana? We're looking at fast cars, faster asses, and less daddy issues in Formula One. <laughs> Lights out, and here we go, and you know that these cars run on electricity. Welcome to Circuit Breakers, the newest Formula E podcast for your listening and viewing pleasure. My name is Dallas and joined with me is my good friend, Taylor. Taylor, how are you doing, friend? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Now, the biggest question when someone partakes in a new podcast is they, they want to know what to expect. So what can Formula E fans expect from this podcast? Yeah, you know, when it comes to expectations for this podcast, uh, we are going to be doing race recaps. We're going to be providing commentary for each race in the season. And I think most importantly is that uh, we are just avid fans of the entire series all the way through the paddock. And we are here to poke fun and laugh the entire way through the season. I'll pick the banana. Now, with any sports podcast, one can expect that They'll cover the events, they'll cover the drama, they'll cover any sort of moves, trades, sign signings, re-signings, but what makes this show different? You know, honestly, we are probably what makes us different in that there is nothing about us that is professional journalism here in Dallas. We are, we're, we're hobbyists at best, um, and though we have a fanatic uh, mentality to um, – the nitty gritty details of what makes a racing season here. I think the best part of it is that we know the comedy behind these drivers far more than anyone would hope. There is a lot of character up and down the paddock in Formula E. And I think what sets us apart most is that we're bringing just as much character to every single episode we're going to be hosting here with jokes, gags, observations on just about every detail we can um, from the past couple seasons of Formula E. The thing that brought me to Formula E is one day, right kind of at the start of the pandemic, I was just getting spit a bunch of algorithmic answers to what I was trying, what I was hungry for when it came to racing. Um, I'd been watching Formula One to myself and uh, I saw Formula E, um, the New York race where Sam Bird took it with a pile up behind him. After watching that video, I think I was so inspired by what was happening. I felt compelled to start a fantasy league to try to trick my friends into falling into this. And I said, who are the few people in my life that I can convince with enough grace uh, to follow this clown show on wheels uh, at the time of watching. And uh, it came into not only just great friendships and um, some of the funniest belly laughs I've had watching sports, but this whole podcast. I think it should be noted too, that we didn't just find friendship in Formula E. Uh, it has been strengthened uh even more so because of this sport, but I mean, you're, you're one of my oldest friends. So, I mean, we go way back. This isn't a, uh, a chat room find of like, Hey, does anyone like electric cars? But I do. What's your name? It's like, no, like we know each other fairly well. And I hope that, uh, the audience will be able to reflect on that of our chemistry and, and humor. I mean, we've been cracking jokes since, uh, 2007. So yeah. Cause Dallas, you didn't have much background in motorsport until I dropped this on your plate. What, what was the what was this, the narrative and like your experience when I said all of this? The standpoint that you were trying to pitch it from is like this is depending on who it is. This is like a long shot. But when I read it, I'm like, yeah, well, I'm down. Why not? Uh, but it is true. Formula E is truly my introduction to motorsport. It is the very first season and series that I followed. And because of that, you know, I've, I've branched off since then. I've followed Formula E or uh, Formula One rather, um, to, you know, every single race last year, but there's something about Formula E. It's like, you always remember your first 
And so formally is like, that's, that's my thing. I'm down for it. So I got that message. Hey, do you want to join this formula E fantasy league that I am creating from scratch? And with football, uh, here in the U S being over with the big game that was played, uh, I was sportless. Uh, and that's usually how it works. The season ends in February, starts back up August, September. And so it was a perfect opportunity. Just the timing of like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll watch this. And it's like, oh, it's not every single week. Oh, you can find the replays, uh, because some of the races are at, you know, wee hours of the morning or late at night. So I was like, yeah, I'll jump on it. But I had zero experience with motorsport this was the first and even before i had seen a race because i was so casual when i joined the league and started quote unquote following the sport uh on the the eve of season eight i didn't really look up videos i was like hey this is something fun to do with friends one of the first videos that i saw published by formula e was their season eight preview like <laughs> launch <trailer. laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah was a, uh, i had mixed feelings like after that video ends which in this video it's you know they're racing and then there's an incident and the drivers get out and now they're racing on foot and i'm watching this i'm like so you don't need cars for this league <laughs> yeah there's, there's by this whatever means possible yeah, you know, I sometimes when I see what the marketing team at Formula E does, like the only thing you can really think is like the amount of money you spent to make this Jason Bourne uh, race through like <laughs> Brazilian <laughs> shanties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like running past dudes eating their ramen. Like, you know, like it's a, <laughs> it's a fever dream um, that they are pitching – for every season, season, every it's a fever dream that they are pitching for every season opener. I get so um, excited to know what direction they're going to try to take uh, the hype that they're building around this each launch of a of a new season. I would like to imagine too at the end of season eight, the the whole marketing team, the executives are like, "That was a fucking hit," and then they come in, the top dog there is like. All right, people, we killed it with that foot race for season eight. We need to go bigger for season nine. What do we do? And then there's an intern in the corner like, can these cars fly? And then the executive is just like, fly. No, not even fly, fall. We're going to push yeah. it out of the plane. <laughs> We're going to see how well it flies. That's exactly it. Uh, ever, ever, You know, that's... Um, that's the thing that I love most about Formula E. You know, um, it is so perfectly imperfect in everything it does. There is this prestige and rigor and rigidness that is Formula One, um, and it's it's its own thing. It's a beautiful, fun, intense sport to watch, and Formula E is in so many ways this weird little side circus that pops up in the center of a city and puts on some of the best racing I have seen in single seaters. And the drivers are their own characters. They have so many just quirks and traits um, that for us as fans, like I know for the past three years, as we've run this league, the amount of jokes and commentary that we can provide each and every season as it continues to grow, um, just strengthens. And, um, that's, that's what I'm in it for. And that's, that's why we're here. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a great relationship between your, your knowledge of just motorsport in general and your knowledge with formula E. Uh, complemented with my still newbie attitude of it all because this sport is growing. And we were actually able to make it down to the Portland e Pre last year, the first motorsport event I have ever been to. And when we finally rendezvoused uh, at the track, you were telling me, 
you were like, this is insane. I was at IndyCar last year and there were like half this many people. So it's a growing sport and there's going to be people that are coming along. They're like, well, I want to learn more if they fall in love with it the way that we fall in love with it. And they're like, I want to learn more about the sport. Uh, That's where hopefully we come on your radar because you get me as a newbie that doesn't really know what to expect, uh, knows that it's a hell of a fun league to watch, but I'm going to have questions that maybe some newer fans will have. And Taylor, you're going to be that that guiding light uh, to kind of break everything down. And I think the biggest thing for us is that we want to make the listening more fun than it is anything like more fun than anything. Um, there's nothing wrong with talking uh, in a dry Jason Statham monologue about the efficiency of the Jaguar powertrain versus the Porsche. But uh, unfortunately, the reality is, is that we're just a couple of boys um, stateside and we're here to laugh along the way with you guys just as much as we hope to make you laugh. Just a couple of yanks that enjoy cars that plug in. We're going to talk about it. Uh, speaking of cars that plug in and just uh, the the field of drivers and teams, uh, Taylor, who is your favorite driver on this grid? Oh, man. Um, you know, that's the, that's the best part for me is that I don't have one singular favorite driver. The grid is so competitive, literally top to bottom. I think every driver on that grid is capable of winning a race. However, my favorite driver, I've picked him every single year. I've had ups, I've had downs, heartbreaks and wrist breaks is uh, Robin Frines, I think is uh, one of the best drivers on the grid for the value and oftentimes kind of stays unslung in uh in the paddock he's like the uh the alpha of the beta drivers hey even betas need an alpha and yeah robin i uh i don't really know much about him aside from his wrist and i hovered over this because i knew that you were going to mention his name and even though it's not him saying it i think of it every time i hear robin and friends together i i i hurt my head really badly that's uh, that's not Robin Franz, though. No, that's Buemi. That's Count Buemi. Count Buemi. Yeah, I don't think Robin made a made a peep. No, I think he, he didn't. Uh, <laughs> but whatever. He, sl- he slammed in. He slammed in. Turned his wrist into a pretzel. Um, and they asked, "Are you okay, Robin?" And his response was, "Yeah, hurts." <laughs> Bad. <laughs> you know, there's different levels of passion in each driver in this series that we uh, that we try to pull. Um, how about you, Dallas? Who is your favorite driver? I'm I'm in the same boat as you. It's it's difficult to pick a single one. the The breakdown of this uh, fantasy Formula E league that we're in uh, it's it's evolved over this the third year that we're doing this. Uh, but the first year, my introduction to the sport didn't have to do with the teams. We didn't select a team. We were just, we had three drivers we picked and I knew absolutely nothing about this sport. I can't emphasize this enough because going into that draft, my strategy was to look at the names and be like, which ones are fun? Because being an American with that has been primarily subjected to American culture, the majority of my life, seeing these European names, I'm like, these are pretty fun. <laughs> my first pick was Stoffel Van Dorn. Yeah, I'm like, what yeah. Is Stoffel? What I is remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. So I picked Stoffel and then came around again my turn. I'm like, all right, where, where are these fun names here? Um, Turvey. That sounds like scurvy. Give me Oliver Turvey. So I took him. RIP to Neo. And then my last pick, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm running thin on these fun names, but what is Edo? Edo Ardo? What is this? So it's like Edo Mortara. Edo! No! And those <laughs> names, it just so happen to be, and this is this is true in any fantasy sports league that I've ever played in. My first year doing it is always just I strike gold, even if I have no yeah. knowledge. 
you managed to pick two funny names that happen to be the two title contenders for the majority of that first season. Ito, you know, kind of plummeted towards that mid grade, but you had uh, essentially an unstoppable force with everyone's favorite Prius driver, um, Oliver Turvey. Uh, so like you were just, you were cranking in points in a way that very few of us could keep up with. Um, so, uh, for the record, um, this fantasy league that I organized, um, so some of my background is, uh, I have a lot of game design backgrounds, uh, and, and design background. And, um, I designed a fantasy league, uh, based on putting together a team that you actually follow through the whole season. Um, I know there's a lot of F1 series and, um, and fantasy leagues where you're picking drivers uh, per race. With this one, at the start, we do a draft and we have a budget and we pick drivers to run and follow the entire series in. And drivers are, uh, their cost is based on uh, their performance across their whole season, across the past couple's, you know, uh, cycles. Um, in order to kind of figure out, you know, who is a premier predominant driver, who is maybe a lesser driver, and to try to build a balanced team uh, with the money you have. And it, boy, it gets close uh, in certain ways. And for some reason, no matter how hard we try, there's always a runaway victor. And Dallas, you were the first example of it. First season, it, there was no contest. I mean, I could not be caught. There were still like well, four races, four rounds left. And it was like, oh, looks like I win Formula E. And then you did something very special, not just for me as the champion, uh, but also uh, I believe uh, Andrew, our other friend in that league, didn't he get dead last? You got him something special yeah, too? Yeah, he, he got dead last um, in, uh, in his cycle of the uh, of, uh, series. Um and so for your championship trophy, uh, we paid for um, Eduardo Mortara to uh, give a pep talk to uh, our last place uh, contestant, um, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. This is a quick uh, video message uh, from my side. I think that uh, you weren't lucky uh, with your Fantasy Formula E season uh, challenge with your friends, uh, Dallas and, uh, and Taylor. So they asked me uh, uh, to do a quick video for you. Uh, don't give up. It worked out because Andrew absolutely crushed the following season, even with a greater record than yours in the first. Yeah, <laughs> Andrew's team. yeah it was a it was a nightmare um, in the making uh, every single race uh, with a Jake Dennis Pascal Verline um, lineup for himself. So uh, you know those mid tier drivers that then have those incredible seasons just. You never know when it's going to happen or who's going to break through or stand out. And last year um, was one of the most exciting years of motorsport because it was a new season with a new grid, new drivers. And uh, it seemed like that title fight was truly fought to the very bitter end and not just between two people, but a, a grid at large. Um, I think what, going into the final two races last year, there was a theoretical title fight for four people. Yeah, who was it? Uh, Jake Dennis, Nick Cassidy, Pascal was slightly Nick, right? out of, and, and Mitch was like in a golden window he could win. Um, then he yeeted it yeah. into Cassidy, right? Uh, that oh. was Buemi. <laughs> yeah, Buemi ruined that, that championship. So yeah, because they were teammates on a vision. Cassidy just moved over to Jaguar because he hated um, uh, working with Sebastian Buemi across that season. God, he's such a, a sweet lad, Cassidy, that is. Yeah, such a yeah it's guy. frustrating. It's so just it's like frustrating. I, <laughs> Nick Cassidy, I'm a fan of of him as well. I mean, there's there's no there's always like the the heel, right? The the villain in a racing league, but I think all of these drivers have such lovable characteristics in their their own way it's not like you're rooting for someone to struggle it's like i just want everyone to have a good time and fight a good race yeah and and you know i think there's so much um uh like 
segmenting in in Formula One across their paddock, right? Like drivers don't sit down and talk with each other, track walk with each other. You know, there is your you and your teammate versus the rest of the grid. And with this, it just feels like there's a camaraderie. Like you can tell that there's drivers that do not like each other in a lot of ways. Like I'm pretty sure Sebastian Buemi, as passionate and as fiery and as much as he screams on radio, um, it's probably like one that someone wouldn't go get a beer with on the weekend. Uh, but, you know, simultaneously, it's just like you have Antonio Felix da Costa, who is probably the most lovable uh, teddy bear of a race car driver I've ever seen. Um, and that's that's the virtue of it is it, it feels like, you know, this is a cast of characters from a sitcom uh, like The Office, right, where there's so much character that's just brought into this sport. Um, and the best part is, is that it is virtually uncensored or unfiltered. Um, there is a lot of like press talk speak, you know, drivers have uh, interviews where you're just like, oh, that's the most flaccid penis conversation I've ever heard. But then they get out on track and you are, you're stunned every time. Yeah, well, and the fact too, uh, correct me if I'm wrong with Formula One, but Formula E releases like a, a supercut of all the the radio, all the chatter <laughs> over the radios. <laughs> they do. They uh, they 100 do. Um, it is uh, hysterical. Um, you know, every single driver has uh, a funny thing to say at some point during a race, and I don't know if it's just the context in which they cut things together to put that <laughs> for us. Um, but I almost feel like sometimes the race engineers are just pranking people uh, for <laughs> trolling their drivers, you know, like what plan is banana? Who, what is that? You know, like you, in what context will you ever say that on a racetrack? Um, and the thing is, is he says it, he says it with such, such ferocity. It's impossible not to laugh. Um, Operation banana. How big the banana? Banana, how big a banana? Is a banana this big, how do you, what is the margins of banana? Someone that envision was just walk past Buemi one day. He was eating lunch. He was eating a banana. I'd be like, oh, bananas. He's yeah. like, banana. And he's like, <clears throat> he went straight to the engineers. Like, we need uh, a planned banana. I just heard the dude say <laughs> banana. We got to do it. <laughs> like, I fucking love it. What's up, you E-heads? It's that time of the show for you to get off of the racing line and into attack mode to give this show a boost. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like this episode and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening on an audio platform, head on over to YouTube at Circuit Breakers Pod and do the very same thing. It gives us that algorithmic boost that really gets our wheels turning. So thank you. And back to the show. I'm, I'm wondering, I have maybe a fringe theory of you know you're comparing the the cutthroatedness of formula one where it's like hey your corner is your corner and you know you make eye contact with the other drivers because fuck them but with formula e everyone's kind of buddy buddy now the race is the race these are true legitimate competitors that live and breathe racing but with breathing this is where i'm curious there's no gasoline in formula e cars so maybe, here's my fringe theory, that maybe the exhaust of a super hyper ultra performance motor, maybe there's something in that exhaust that just kind of breeds contempt to just compete and win and fuck all the rest. But then you don't get that with Formula E. You just get the and everyone loves that. Yeah, Dallas, you've uh, you've made that noise. Um and maybe this is a segment to lead into. Um, there is, I think, a big, larger bubble of people that look at Formula E as this kind of like lesser, un, undesirable series. Um, and they're not, you know, interested in like uh, giving it a shot because maybe they're already F1 fans or they're watching IndyCar or or um, WEC or Rally or, or any of the major racing series. Formula E's is kind of a goofy offshoot series uh, to a lot of people, and it doesn't have a lot of validity or rigor. Um, but part of that, I think, is just strictly the sound of the cars. 
I've heard it countless times. People just can't get behind the sound. They put that sound up. But Dallas, you love that sound. I do. I think it's one of the coolest things. The first race, what was the first race of season eight? Was it Deria? I think the first round in season eight was Deria. If not Deria, then Mexico. Either way, doesn't matter. When I first saw those lights go out and the cars shoot off and the re, re, re of those cars, I'm like, yo, this is pretty fucking cool. Now, you're on the, you're, you're kind of speaking on behalf of motorsport fans because they've grown up. They, they love the internal combustion. They love the sound. They love everything. But this sport, whether it is Formula E as the existing body 25 years from now or a different racing series, they're all going to be electric. Now, the one thing that I can, uh, you know, brag about um, a hipster approach is the car that I drive is a, a plug in hybrid. It can run on battery and it is a Chevrolet Volt to 2014. That's when EV technology in the US market was just kind of sort of coming out. It wasn't great. The car is dog shit aside from the unlimited miles per gallon. But the fact that I had I took some some ownership when I first started watching Formula E season eight. Uh, there's yeah, so you made it a you made it a slogan for yourself as if you came into the series an expert. Well, I, I had to credit it because uh, if you just drive a, a regular internal combustion vehicle, you don't really know what it's like to drive an electric car. So I felt a weird, distorted connection to these Formula E drivers because it's like I know what they're going through. I know what it's like to go into a corner and, and do those regen braking because you only have so much battery. So my point is, is the the ownership that people who love cars, whether or not they're into motorsport, if they love cars, if they see it as an extension of their personality, then it, if they're going to get into a motorsport uh, series to follow, they're going to kind of embody whatever they have. Now, my Chevy Volt, um, I I kind of would defend against it being an extension of my personality because it's uh, shit brown. Um, there's not a lot of character to it, but it it's it's electric. And so Formula E, that's probably a, a driving factor of uh, another layer rather of why I gravitated towards this series because I'm like, oh, they're, they're doing what I do, except like way better. And so as this sport grows and as motorsport and just transportation technology in general changes, there are more people that are going to be driving EVs. And then if they find themselves in an opportunity that I was in where it's like, hey, there is a electric racing series. It's just like a Formula One car, you know, for the layperson, it's like Formula. Oh, I've heard of Formula One. Well, there's Formula E and it's electric. And I know you love your Tesla so much or whatever EV you're driving. So they're going to check it out. And it is, I may be in a minority right now because of all the, 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 the gear heads, the oil heads that are like, Hey, if it ain't combusting internally, then neither am I, but it's going to change over time. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong uh, to you, the listener and the viewer, if the sound is dog shit and you don't enjoy it let us know. Or if it's like, Hey, you agree with me. It's like, I love this sound too. Let me know. Maybe we'll run a poll, right? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you, I think you brought up a like fantastic point there and that, yeah, this is a growing market. Um, you know, and the, the thing is, um, I could not care less about electric vehicles if I'm being honest. Uh, but at the same time, I recognize that, what they offer and bring to the table is something that is completely unique to them that uh, combustion engines or internal combustion engines just can't offer. Um, but my reason for looking past the whirring of that engine uh, is because of what those electric engines do on track that a Formula One engine or a combustion engine just doesn't. And that is street circuit racing they have incredible zero to 60 so it is 
just launching around every corner and they make these cars difficult to drive. Um, but the amount of torque, the amount of strategy that goes into this series from top to bottom, as far as just like racing a vehicle goes, the amount of knowledge that goes into the software, the management of your energy, all the way through keeping those tires gripped to the road with the torque to get the best launch out of an exit. It's wholly unique to what this series does. And the fact that their EVs allows them to race in street circuits that every other screaming V12 or hybrid V6 or whatever high performance engine is, is about uh, just can't because they are quiet and they are not destroying the uh, ecosystem or quality of life uh, beyond setting up a circuit for a single day and tearing it down the next. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful thing that they just offer um, from its DNA alone. My response to someone who has a their their biggest gripe with the series is the sound, uh, and some people might be critical on on just the street circuits or the tires that they use the the all purpose you know the treaded ones uh just watch it muted i mean i i wanted to do that uh for the first two seasons when here in the states the races were on cbs with commentators that did not give a single they shit had no clue uh, <laughs> what was going on they were just amazed that a vehicle could be running on electrons baby uh, lights out and here we go, and do you know that these cars run on electricity up to 350 kilowatts in the attack mode? And there goes Verline. Verline? But why is there a W there, partner? Yeah. It was it was awful. I, I wanted to put it on mute. Um, but yeah, that is an interesting point of that I hadn't really considered is the the accessibility, the lack of noise just from a decibel standpoint where it's like, yeah, you can do this in a city. The other thing too that I just found out uh, this season is I didn't realize that the the field was unaware of the other driver's percentage. They had no idea what, or they have no idea what it is until it gets thrown up on TV. And it's like, here are all the drivers battery percentages and then that's when they know and then they can shift the strategy so that just knowing that as of you know the last race i'm like yeah that's an extra layer of freaking awesomeness yeah there's a complexity in the strategy that goes into formula e that is uh nail baiting all the way to the end because that two percent of energy uh they are saving almost everything they can by about midway through the race and trying to drive as slowly well as quickly as they can. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a conundrum to think about. Um, just the, the way that you have to drive as fast while being as resourceful, um, while not getting chewed up alive by Count Buemi, uh, in your rear views. Uh, it's, it's insane. And the cars are also tiny. They're so much smaller than uh, the Formula One cars that when you go to tracks like Monaco, the overtaking is like in the triple digits comparatively to what happens. So every single lap, you are seeing race leads change. You're seeing the midfield disperse and more and more uh, strategy revolve around sitting down and trying to save as much energy so you can try to make that sprint right at the end kind of closing segments to try to claw those positions up like you know there's so much risk and rewards to every single approach a driver takes um and that riskier approach has so much um consequence in in so many ways i mean there's been races before where on the last corner driver runs out of energy famously pascal verlein in uh in mexico uh routed the corner out of energy and got passed by lucas de Grassi on the last corner of the last lap um there are things like that that happen more often than not or running out of energy and having another driver plow into the back of you to push you across the line to finish <laughs> yeah, that yeah. happened last year yeah. it was like you know what are you supposed to do 
uh, when you are putting everything on the line to just try to finish in the fastest position possible, it's a, uh, it's such an exciting, uh, race all the way through. And, um, it's uh, e- each circuit offers something wholly unique to it as well. Um, you can't, you can't dismiss it. 